Now, um, this is uh, obviously outrageous, and uh, the, the reason I've got these uh, uh, two things together, the radiation and the flowers, is at least if you don't like the message, uh, you get some benefit from seeing the flowers. <laughs> um, and actually, my aim is to make you afraid, but I think you'll be rather surprised about what you're going to be afraid of. All right. And there's, um, unfortunately, I've got to give you a little bit of physics background, but uh, there won't be very much. And the, the first thing is the, let me find my cursor, yes, here it is. There is things called alpha radiation, and we're not going to be dealing much with them at all. Um, they're stopped by paper, even. The one we're going to be talking about is gammas. And if this will stay here while I demonstrate, to stop gammas, you need about this thickness of almost anything. Uh, but soil this thick will stop almost all gamma radiation. And that's just a simple, useful thing to remember if you're ever in a nuclear exchange. I pray not. OK, and now, of course, this guy here um, is uh, has got uranium metal, and this is just to show you that it's mainly alpha particles and some betas that it gives out, they don't go through the gloves. So he's quite safe, you see. But that's very different from the gammas. And this is one of the most important things and the hardest thing for you to perhaps uh, remember. But uh, the different types of radiation that you're exposed to, this blue one here, that's called radon. It's a gas, a radioactive gas. It's natural. It's everywhere. You're breathing it now. You're breathing it some all places. Sometimes uh, more different places will have more of it than others, especially caves. The Waitomo people have are radiation workers. Would you believe? Anyway, there are things like medical X-rays. Another one up here though is cosmic rays. You're getting penetrated by cosmic rays all the time, and it's quite a significant part of the whole. And then you're getting from rocks and soils some of these gamma rays. And finally, internally, you have inside you potassium, which is mildly radioactive. And so we're getting this from all sorts of sources. All right, but the three important ones are the cosmic, the from the rocks and soils, and what's inside us. Okay, that's the end of that physics lesson. Well, just to what potassium looks like, as you know, it's they keep it in oil, otherwise it tends to, uh, burst, well, not quite burst into flame, but it doesn't behave as you would like. Well, just for fun, where are the highest and lowest radiation areas in New Zealand? Well, this strange thing would be the bottom of a cave. And the If you've got stagnant air, have radon accumulating. It's actually a very heavy gas. Would you believe it sinks? And so is maybe. It sorry. Is it harmful? Um, enough of it is harmful, and the uh, on the Colorado Plateau, uranium miners tended to die um, when they had far too much of this that they breathed in. It's quite a long story. The lowest, and this may surprise you. The Red Hills at the bottom of Westland, that is the, uh, the, the southernmost part of Westland, uh, they are funny because they've got very little radioactive elements in them, these Red Hills, and the plants don't like growing there, as some of you will know. So the lowest place you could get radiation, uh, suspend yourself perhaps in a coffin or something, uh, perhaps this amount deep, and you're protected from all the radiation, but uh, it doesn't seem a very good place to go. Anyway, the highest radiation is Parliament. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We did a survey in the 70s from DSIR, wandered around by the Geiger counter. The highest place, which was three times normal, was underneath there. It's a fact. In the basement. Uh, it's a kind of uh, just a, an arch which doesn't lead anywhere very much. In fact, there's probably uh, greater radiation down there, and there's probably radon trap down there as well. Anyway, our fear behind radiation, of course, cancer. So we're going to be talking about that a bit. 
And there's a number of stages in the development of cancer, and this is uh, not a nice subject to talk about, and so it's rather good, I've got the flowers. <laughs> the DNA is hit by radiation, perhaps, or some other things, and it isn't prepared because you've got repair going on all the time inside you. A fun fact is that the molecule of DNA is so long, it tends to, it tends to spontaneously break, it has to be continuously repaired. You're, you're not just a stable thing, you're a work in progress all the time, being repaired. Next stage, the cells divide abnormally and grow. The uh, immune system of the body really doesn't deal with this. It just treats it as part of the body. And so that's a further stage, a further thing to happen. And finally, the cells spread throughout the body. Now, there's each, each of these, these four things. Uh, there's my cursor word. I think you can probably see that on the screen. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're independent. And so the, the radiation is only one of them, and it's only a minor one of them. So that's worth knowing too. <coughs> Various triggers. And cancer is a random process, and radiation exposure is a minor factor. Good. Now this is a very confusing diagram shows a little bit of the process that basically what it's trying to say is you have an error and the, all the enzymes chop out part of that DNA and rebuild it. It's quite extraordinary. And to show it again, um, you have a complicated series of enzymes. There are two of these enzymes which are, they call them polymerases, you don't need to know that. Uh, but they are constantly repairing, and so they're, um, they're full-time occupation, it's a full-time occupation to do repairs. Um, my uh, assistant or uh, interrupter behind me is um, saying how many breaks. It's, it's uh, enormous, you're getting millions of these breaks in your cells all the time, uh, every day. Uh, and as she says, and prepared. Would you like to take over? <laughs> what them with that camera? <laughs> okay, so you're being repaired all the time, which is lovely. So there, but there's actually another one. You've got the three, you've got three of them. Two are the ones which are going all the time, and there's an extra one if you get an unusually large dose of radiation that kicks in and it, it repairs and it does it very, very well. How efficient are these? Oh, uh, oh, wait a minute, yes, I forgot. This repairs 99.9% .9 of the damage. That's, that's pretty good going. <coughs> okay, well, how much radiation is safe? They found effects, of course, from the Hiroshima bomb. I worked in Hiroshima for some time. After the Second World War, they set up this thing here, a joint collaboration between Japan and the USA to study the effects. They took 100,000 people from the center of Hiroshima and that had been exposed to the radiation. Some of them had only barely survived. They took another group as a control, a, a lot from the outskirts of Hiroshima where they didn't get a dose. And they studied them, they called them in for a complete medical um, examination every two years. And they've, they've been doing that since the end of World War II, and now they're looking at the second generation to see what effects there may be there. Of course, most of those people are now dead through other natural causes. Did you say you went there, Neil? Um, yes, I've been been here, and I was I was working um, uh, mainly at the university, but uh, a lot of collaboration with these people. That's another whole story. We were looking at particularly at Kazakhstan, where the Soviets did their tests, and what effects there might might have been on the population there. Anyway, now the results were really quite surprising. And this, is, this was a shock to me, and I think it will be a shock to you. 
they took those who barely surviving the Hiroshima radiation, they were very strongly exposed. There were only about 5% more cancer deaths than the patrols. I wouldn't have believed that, frankly. This is a nasty diagram from their work. They found that as you had more radiation, yes, there were more cancers, there were more, uh, more deaths. Um, then there was, this is the control level for those who weren't exposed. And so, yes, as you've got more radiation, you get more deaths. But you see, that's 80 compared with about 70. It's only, um, it's only added about 5% to the total. Now that was, I, I must admit, I was very surprised to read that. Okay, and uh, no effects on the second generation. They haven't found anything so far that's uh, uh, anything for, and they've been studying quite some time. That's, uh, that's again a, a real surprise. Well, after the um, after this study carried on for some time, perhaps into the 60s, people started making decisions about what level of radiation you could be exposed to safely. Now, this was the original diagram here from their, the uh, foundation's work, and hmm, they did. This was the lowest figure they had, the lowest people exposed, and below that. There wasn't any effect they could, they could tell. They weren't sure what was happening down here. Um, and this was the dose that uh, you were getting about uh, every year. It's, it's, it's very low compared with the uh, amounts they got at Hiroshima, of course. But what happens in this area? And uh, they hadn't found any effects in this area on the Hiroshima people. And this looked like the amount of um, uh, deaths was just just sort of stayed static about here. And so they said, well, we're not sure. What we will do is we will assume that the, the harm you get is proportional to the dose. We'll say that there's some effects at all levels like that. Now, this, there's no evidence for this, but this was a conservative assumption. <coughs> and so they put this into law. The, and so they were very conservative, they said harm is directly proportional to dose and you should keep the dose as low as reasonably achievable. And they put it into law almost everywhere without uh, real support. Uh, but it was conservative and who would argue with that? But subsequently they started to get some surprises. There were many studies which seem to show that moderate radiation, less than Hiroshima, but uh, way down in that doubtful region, that there, it was doing the animals it's even some good, which is very odd. Yeah. And uh, this list leads to a conflict because achieving these very low levels is very expensive. Uh, for a, a bit of tubing in a nuclear power plant, the uh, extra care that they have to go to pushes the price up six times. Now there are now several thousand studies which produce confirmed and definitive evidence of stimulation and or benefit. So maybe this Alara principle was often pointless. Uh, this, is, this has been a conflict therefore for some decades. And it seems that the repair enzymes actually t uh, temporarily restore the DNA to condition somewhat better than the original. Rather like if you break a bone, it's actually the repair is actually stronger than the original. And so some of the people like the French Academy of Scientists here are saying, uh, this, is, this is pretty f silly. The, that uh, linear model gap, that place where they, were, they didn't have the data, um, saying it's just proportional. It's not consistent with the current radiobiological knowledge. There are repairs going on all the time. And so they said they haven't been able to detect significant risk even on large populations that they're studying. And they, they showed in fact that this is still the French Academy of Science, hence the Eiffel Tower to the right. Um, there was a decrease in, the, in their cancers. It's, to a limited extent, um, it seemed that some radiation was uh, moderately good for you, not spectacularly good for you, but possibly. But here's what's happened. 
for, here's the legal limit there for New Zealand, radiation workers, they, won't, they, they say you shall not have more than this amount in a year, and this is compared with us, and for the average member of the public, they've put a, a limit way down here, but what do you, um, it's all this a waste of time, and is perhaps some radiation good for you? Well, they went on to say, they, uh, again, um, they, there's no direct evidence that uh, even leukemia, which is a sensitive one, um, they're very skeptical, therefore. But the, uh, what is happening um, is that the people who make the laws say, oh, we'd better keep it safe. We don't want to be accused of killing off people. So the, they're very slow to change some of this. Now, here's another thing. There was a place called Mayak, where they made plutonium in Russia. And they ended up with uh, less cancers. But there's a thing called the healthy worker effect, which uh, can come into play here. I'll explain this in a second. And again, um, three countries, uh, various nuclear workers. Um, the effects of the exposed ones, only half what they predicted. Radiologists, a big survey of them, 22,000 people. And they could not find um, increased cancer. It seemed to have been plateaued. Now, the healthy worker effects, many of you may know this, but if you are sick chronically, you're not going to come into work. And so if you're studying workers, uh, it may be rather artificial. They may be un uh, artificially healthy. Okay, so some of these studies you've got a query about. Um, and, uh, no, we'll go back. Um, now, this was done by a guy called Bernard Cohen. Took him right on in a whole lot of counties in the United States. And this is more radon up this end and less radon down here. It looks like the more radon you get, the better it is for you. This is for lung cancer. What's going on? It seems very persuasive, doesn't it? And yet, nothing is quite as simple as it sounds. Um, way out here, they found out a couple of more um, tests done by other people, put some points way, way off the graph, which makes you wonder what is going on here. So it's not straightforward. Still arguing. But uh, some people are arguing, okay, you've, uh, premature cancer deaths may be caused by insufficient radiation. And uh, this guy who did this, he was called Lucky, um, in <laughs> Israel. Uh, again, um, now this is a case where there wasn't a healthy worker effect. This were people exposed in the nuclear industry and they were compared with other people in the same industry who weren't exposed but had similar um, jobs. And so this cut their cancer rate in half. Well, 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 hard to know what to make of this. Well, another way is to go to the radiation hotspots in the world. There are such. Are there more cancers in such a place? And this just shows that there are places which have these high radiations uh, areas. <clears throat> this one, Kabuna Kapali, excuse me, anyone who knows how to pronounce that better than me. <clears throat> now this black stuff here, this is radioactive. Quite, quite strongly radioactive, really. And so all the population here, this is extreme South India, they have uh, considerably more radiation level than normal, but much less than the, the Hiroshima case. Another one, Ramsar in Iran. Now this is quite a disorienting slide, so I should say that out this direction is north. This is the Caspian Sea. This is extreme south of the Caspian Sea. And Ramsar, again, there seem to be a lot of people living here, and uh, some of the evidence from there is that they're slightly healthier than uh, than average. So, well, another piece of odd evidence. Guara Party, Brazil, and the the uh, young boy, I think, down here on the black sand. That's again more of this radiation radiation rich stuff. Or I should say that the black sands we've got in New Zealand are not radioactive, different sort of minerals altogether. Another one. 
and this may surprise you a bit, Niue Island is the equal of all these hotspots in the world. You know, a strong amount of natural radiation, not fallout. And it's only, it's not sand, it's only the soils and the DSIR the, the, the and other groups have been studying this for a long, long time, since the 50s, trying to work out how this has come about. Well, they, they look healthy enough, and the answer, in fact, is that in all these areas, lots of big, big studies for a long time, they have not found excess cases. Here's another the case doesn't mean so much, but it just shows you what you're dealing with, perhaps. Professor Imanaka is Professor of Physics at Kyoto University in Japan, uh, a colleague of mine, and his mother walked into Hiroshima, the center where it was wrecked, the day after the explosions. And she got quite a high dose of radiation. She didn't die of cancer. So, what about deformities? Physical deformities. Yes, they've, um, again, they have no evidence of any of those at the bottom level of the uh, Hiroshima data. Um, so, um, it's radiation. We, we are all afraid of radiation. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the conclusion really, below industrial levels of exposure, um, the risk is negligible. There may be all sorts of effects down there, but the repair enzymes are giving us a, a good level of protection. So some um, other interesting anecdotes. Um, whoop, uh, Chernobyl, of course, in 1986, the idiot technicians put the reactor in the most unsafe possible condition and then tried to ramp it up to full power and of course it exploded and uh, a 2,000 ton cover was blown off which gives you some idea of the force these things generate. This was when I was working um, uh, in Europe so uh, a minor story from there but meanwhile a, a bit of an apocryphal story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little housewife wants to swap two radioactive ex-husbands for one active husband. <laughs> so this is the uh, where I was working. Uh, this is a rather amazing looking building in, in Monaco uh, on the side of a cliff. It's actually an oceanographic museum and the, uh, the laboratory is, is elsewhere in Monaco now. But during this time, of course, the fallout was coming at us from Chernobyl and it was depositing itself all over leafy vegetables, for example. This is terrifying. Um, and to show you here, um, particularly plastering North Italy, and, but coming over into France a little bit, well, if you're Italy, what do you do if you are afraid of radiation? You say, all the people who are growing cabbages and lettuces up here, you're not allowed to sell them. Yeah. Get rid of them. France, meanwhile, says, oh, look, only a very small amount of is, is uh, exposed here. Look, um, we won't put a ban on lettuces or anything. So what do the farmers do? They bring all their produce over the border into France <laughs> and sell it to the people in Monaco, which is exactly what they did. Um, and so the people in the lab said, did the calculation using the, uh, the law as it stood there, how much lettuce is unsafe to eat per day? And the answer is 7.5 <laughs> It wasn't the end of the difficulties. Uh, Silver wires are used routinely to detect nuclear particles in reactors. This is, uh, this is very clever technology. They, you actually get a small electric current generated in the silver, um, and you can detect that and you can work out what the um, radioactivity is down there. Well, 
what happens if your reactor explodes? At Chernobyl, 25 kilograms of silver wires were vaporized. We found the radioactive silver fallout, quite invisible of course, in Monaco algae. Okay, so the newspaper was interested. It said, oh, tell us about it. So they interviewed us and the news report finally <coughs> said, scientists find radioactive silver wires in Monaco algae oil. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some people, I'm afraid, tend to take the reaction that um, God's greatest mistake was to give France to the French. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Fukushima in Japan. 2011, three reactors were destroyed through the um, aftermath of the tsunami. It's quite a saga, I won't go into it in too much detail, except it looks something like this um, after the, uh, the problems, and not a great deal is obviously visible. Well, there was a, the center of the earthquake, the epicenter was here offshore, and Fukushima is down here, and um, it, was, uh, it was a huge disaster from that earthquake. 16, 17,000 people, something like that, were killed through the tsunami. All right, well, that is where Fukushima is, and the province, and uh, this is back to the reactor, and they had, a hy they had hydrogen explosions, and I won't go into the details of why, but it results from the meltdowns that they had in the reactor. And, of course, there, there was fallout distributed. Oh, yes, what does Fukushima mean? Happy Island. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> here is Fukushima, uh, and the reactors are on the coast and fallout is deposited inland. Uh, here's Fukushima again, and I want to especially talk about Iitate village, which is here, and they, they got 50 times, well the red areas, you'd get 50 times the normal exposure, which is just at the level, the bottom level of those Hiroshima doses, and um, about level to the, the controls people in, in Hiroshima. And so, this means that, oh yes, they had a lot of problems during that tsunami, and, and the people who were working in the, uh, the reactor complex, there were various deaths, but not through radiation. Um, there were apparently six who, who died. Now, for the people who might have died of radiation, who had Quite significant doses. One person died of leukemia. Maybe that was from the radiation. Maybe. It's not even certain. But the authorities in the whole province ordered a general evacuation. <clears throat> you may be able to guess why I think that that didn't make a great deal of sense. They calculated, even at, uh, given what they know, that the probable deaths in the entire area from radiation would be zero, but they didn't, they wanted to be conservative. <laughs> Meanwhile, in all the evacuations, <laughs> 2,313 people have died to date from either the various car crashes or shifting terminally <laughs> ill people in hospitals and all the other mess that comes about when you suggest a general evacuation. <laughs> oh well. Iitate. And it's got about 6,000 residents and, uh, and you saw it's, it's quite exposed to the radiation. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mr. O Okubo. Mr. Okubo lived in Iitate and <clears throat> he had never been out of the area for his entire life. Extraordinary. At this point he was 102. When he heard that everyone was to be evacuated, 
He went and hanged himself. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not a joke for the, uh, the descendants. And so, what is going on down here? Um, whatever it is, whatever is actually happening at the in your, at your cells, the the actual effects that they can find down here are pretty well zero. There was about twenty in Iitate, there was about twenty five years of normal exposure to radiation, and they decided to try and clean it up. But for twenty five years, I thought. Myself looking at this, I thought I could stay in this place for a year, and this is really not going to have any effects on me. So I asked to stay there for a year, together with Prior here. <laughs> but um, you don't tangle with bureaucracy. They, they, they wouldn't. Uh, they said no. Full, full evacuation. Actually, there were three people who, who refused absolutely, and the authorities couldn't make them shift. Uh, I've no idea what happened. Shot them. <laughs> but they had soil removal, about this amount of soil being removed, it only needs, uh, it doesn't penetrate very far the foil. I don't know what they've done with the plastic bags and all the soil, but anyway. Um, and, well, yes, that's another story. Um, so about of the 6,000 inhabitants, 1,500 have now returned. And even Lonely Planet thinks it might be quite an interesting idea. Uh, things you could do in Iitate. It's got a lot more facilities in our western hills. Anyway, that's Iitate. A colleague um, calculated what the risks were from Tokyo air pollution, what the deaths possibly were from that. You can see how this is Tokyo, actually, this slide. And how does this compare with the Fukushima risk? Well, you can guess what my conclusion would be. But his conclusion? Shift to Fukushima. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite seriously, he said this in a conference. Uh, and a few Japanese clinics are even offering minor radiation exposure to healthy people in the hope that they may actually prevent cancer. Well. It's a minority view. Well, for a few local New Zealand uses of radiation, and girl, I've gone and left a critical prop behind. It doesn't matter. Those alphas I talked about are um, very <coughs> difficult to measure. It, here's the uh, difficulty. If you imagine there's 10 billion people on a planet, like Earth is scheduled to be eventually, or ten, and you've got 10,000 similar planets, awful lot of people, this, the isolation of the one we're interested in would be the equivalent of trying to find one person in all those people and make no mistakes about it. Uh, so it's, it's quite a difficult task. Um, you can use it to date stalagmites and some other things. Well, um, it looks something like this, it's not very exciting. Um, you separate these things using these columns of resins, which are called iron exchange resins. It's complicated, but it works. DSIR took maybe 10 years to develop it, and they had the world's best system, horribly complicated. It took about a day and a half to uh, process a single sample. So you can imagine it's pretty expensive. Um, but for quite some time, it was the best system in the world. And so the uh, oh yes, we'll come on to this. Um, Wairaki. We studied Wairaki and we found that with the steam comes up more radon and hence re uh, emissions than you get from a uh, outside a nuclear reactor. So people think that uh, geothermal is, is pollution free, but it is incredibly radioactive. So they pump it all back down now anyway, and so it just, it's not pollution. Uh, the story which, what a pity I haven't got my prop, but anyway, you've, um, many of you will know where Alpha Hut is in the middle of the Tararuas. It's a favourite stopping place for those people who are doing a, what's called a southern crossing from Otaki Forks out to about 
Pipe Turkey. It takes about three days. And so this was about the, I believe, the early 90s that uh, this story happened. Uh, and Briar here was with me and became rather uh, perturbed because I had been out to the long drop outside the hut. This is the time when actually shifting the old long drop. Um, I believe it's the same one. Um, I'd been out there and wasn't coming back. She came out to find out what was happening and found me with my head down one of these holes. <laughs> and it so happened that a very precious notebook that I had had fallen down inside. It wasn't all that far from the top, um, but as is the way for some of these huts, there are a couple of old empty wine bottles inside, so using them as a kind of tweezers, it was possible to grasp the notebook and pull it out and, and put it in a plastic bag immediately. Um, so, but interesting. When I, when I came in, I was too scared to say anything in case it frightened him and he fell in. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what can you do with a situation of an interestingly stained uh, notebook? You go back to your laboratory where you have a gamma ray irradiator, you put the notebook in overnight um, uh, in the uh, plastic bag I might add. And, uh, Next morning, when you draw it out, it may still have some brown stains on it, but it will be completely sterile. I still have that note. <laughs> with gilt-edged page, gilt pages. Um, the, the Clyde Dam, they were worried lest landslips fall in here and create a sort of tsunami and uh, wreck the dam. So we were able to use the alpha measurements system to show that the, the the landslides and so on had not shifted. They were very, very old. And this was the first time um, anyone worldwide had used that technique for that particular problem. And the, the answer is that New Zealand can sometimes do really world-class science. And that's what I, I take away thing. Um, conclusion. All right. Um, be afraid you're not getting enough radiation. <laughs> um, finally, a, um, a story due to Edward Teller, who um, was involved with the development, in fact, of the hydrogen bomb in America. But he thought um, all the scare about radiation is a bit over the top. He said, now, you have potassium in your bodies. Now, how does all that compare with the amount if you were standing at the perimeter of a nuclear reactor complex? There'd be some radiation there. So he sits down and does the calculation. And he puts it this way, he says that if you're married and sleep with your spouse, you are irradiating each other. <laughs> and how does that amount compare with the uh, standing outside the nuclear reactor. And so, does it give you as much radiation as at the bottom of a nuclear reactor? No, it doesn't quite. To sleep with two women is very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, all right, so. So please excuse me while I enjoy some of my daily radiation dose. <laughs> so thanks for listening to the delights of nuclear radiation. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Yes, yes, yes. Could you talk briefly about the role of iodine in radiation? Yes, the, uh, one of the fallout um, they call them radionuclides. One of the components, anyway, of fallout is an iodine. And um, so if you take stable iodine, it tends to protect um, the, the body. And so they give out iodine tablets um, if, there was, uh, if there is a serious accident with fallout in it. Um, 
that is an, enough, but iodine is useful as other th radioactive iodine is useful as other things as well. Um, it has been used in, um, in medical um, studies um, or medical therapy, would be a better word. Right. Uh, uh, I think Philip was, was Philip. Uh, how, old, how old did you uh, estimate the age of those stalactites? Um, the, the stalactites, the stalagmites, and stalactites. Um, a guy called Professor Paul Williams in um, Auckland, who's now uh, retired, has studied these for many, many years, and um, he. Some of you will know the uh, caves near Tiana. Um, and may have actually been through them, they've got uh, good glowworms in. And he, he showed from this um, a whole range of ages and showed that um, there was a time when um, things were so cold down there that uh, all um, growth of the radiation, of, of the stalactites stopped because everything was frozen and you couldn't get the liquid going down the stalactites. So these, these ages ranged back through the last um, ice ages. We're talking about tens of thousands of years was the, uh, what he was uh, studying. So a, a tremendous range. I don't know if there's lots, but anyway, that was what he was doing. <coughs> the, the situation in Ukraine with the flooding that's going on, it's used to cool the reactors. Right. Um, if that blue, would that have a similar situation? Okay, the, the point is you've got to keep your reactor cold, you need mm. cooling water. Mm. And the, the problem at, first of all, at Fukushima was that the tsunami wiped out all their cooling mechanisms and the supply of electricity to run those cooling mechanisms. So they had all sorts of emergency measures. Now, if you've got a a drop in your water in the, from the Dnieper River, um, you can see that that's happening and you can then slow, uh, close the reactor down and safely and under a, a controlled fashion. Um, the Russians at, at the moment are in control of the reactor complex, um, which is, a, it was, as you've seen, the biggest in Europe. And the, also the IA, the International Atomic Energy Agency part of the United Nations is uh, keeping an inspection going there to make sure that there's, there's no risks. So the bottom line is it can be closed down safely and um, it's not likely there's going to be any, any problems from, from that, but you might be able to run the reactors properly. You might have enough cooling water. You may eventually have to be only able to Run it partly, or run one of the six reactors. That's the current status. When you have uh, go to the dentist, he takes an X-ray, and they uh, 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 set up the machine, and then they run out of the room, and mm -hmm. and then they press a button, and, and come back a few seconds later. Are you saying that's a waste of time? Um, they haven't found any um, effects on the, the dental people who were exposed. So it, it's, um, it's been really quite conservative. Um, you, you can get um, some effects from radiation. In the early days, the people got horrendous doses of, of radiation from X-ray machines. And one of the curious things that happened was people's finger, fingernail, uh, fingerprints here disappeared. They became completely smooth. And up until age, when I, when I was going to work for the um, International Atomic Energy Agency, one of the tests that they said, uh, they give you a lot of questions, do you have normal fingerprints? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everybody today does. We, it's, it's very strongly regulated, but the doses early were enormously high. Um, so, I would say it's, um, a lot of it is probably unnecessary, um, but conservatism is not too bad a thing either. Uh, I think there were some more questions. No? Yeah. Would you be um, concerned about us having a nuclear reactor here in New Zealand then for generating power? 
Um, I, I wouldn't be personally concerned, except from an unusual angle, perhaps, that it, it might be uh, um, a, a real drain. Um, the, they're, they're expensive beasts. You, you're talking about um, probably in excess of a billion dollars to set up a reactor. They are seldom done according to the, uh, the initial cost estimates or the time schedule. And um, it's a, the economics are really rather interesting. If you have a nuclear reactor long term, 25 years or something, they really pay for themselves. They're, they're practically unrivaled in, their, in what they uh, can produce for uh, uh, electricity. But, uh, but the problem is you've had to have this huge capital in, uh, inlay at, for a start and you're paying interest on that capital and so on. Um, so it, there's, a, there's a huge financial burden uh, immediately when you're building it, which is, is quite difficult for uh, many countries. But the risk you wouldn't be worried about, it's just the financial... These days I, I, I would be not worried about the, the risk they're engineered to um, um, take a 747 crashing into them, which um, was even thought of before the, uh, the, Twin, Towers, the Twin Towers thing. Um, and the, the other safety, um, uh, built-in safety effects are such that um, I'm, I'm confident now that they would be reasonably all right. The, the Fukushima thing, that really was extraordinarily exceptional. Um, but even, even there, as we saw, the risks didn't seem to be great in terms of human life, which was it's surprising, but uh, that seems to be the fact. Um, I gather there was plans that the, uh, the, the RERF, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, was going to look at all the people around Iitate in that area to see if there were any more cancers. Um, I don't know if that's actually been put into, into place, but it was planned. Neil. So, have you heard anything about the child in the clusters around the Sellafield power plants? And there's, I'm not familiar with the name of the ones in Ireland, but there's a, the, where they go down. I know from Sellafield where they go yeah. down. Uh, what's your theory on the proposed clusters there that we hear about? All right. The, from, um, from time to time, you, you hear about clusters of um, leukemias or children that would be leukemias. Yeah, predominantly children. Um, and because that's one of the, the most radiosensitive ones. And um, they, the basic answer is they haven't stood up to further investigation. They can pinpoint other locations which ought to be producing the same effects and don't. And so it's a puzzlement. Um, but that's the bottom line that they, it, it's, although they appear to be clusters, it doesn't seem to be reproducible. That's a uh, awkward state you're left in. So, uh, better repeat that for the um, outside Earth's uh, atmosphere, there are what are called the Van Allen belts, which are high radiation, um, for reasons we won't go into just at the moment. But out in space, you are really exposed to cosmic rays. And so there, the fears arise, what will happen to astronauts? And um, as it was, as you probably have seen in the news, there's not been no spectacular things which have happened subsequently to the astronauts going to the moon. And what about to Mars? And this gets a bit more serious. Um, again, they're being pretty conservative. Um, but they, they're talking about possible other um, means of protecting yourself. Uh, but think about it again, you need this amount to, of almost anything, but something pretty dense if you can, um, and that will cut down your radiation a lot, but it will be heavy. And that's, what does that do to the amount of fuel and stuff that you need to have? This is in the, it's in the uh, process of ex real extensive study by NASA and, and other people. Um, it's, I, I, I would judge, um, I'll have to check on some of the figures, but I'd, I'd judge that it would still be 
um, a within a it wouldn't be up quite at the Hiroshima levels, be a bit below. Um, just about 25, 25 years. Some of them may be getting up into the Hiroshima levels. Um, I need to look at the figures there. So th it basically, I'm, what I'm saying is really they're thinking hard about it. Okay, for, again, for the people at the, the back, um, uh, I said that uh, this will stop gamma rays in general, but you'll read uh, occasionally about studies in which they're deep underground in mines and they're detecting particles down there. Um, well, the answer here is it's, it's quite true. There are some very good studies going on at the bottom of some mines in, in a number of places. Um, but, but they are looking for... Um, there are some particles which get as, as far as that through the rock, but not many. And so they, they're, they're counting the odd flash here, here and there, um, whereas you might have 20 million um, going through you every second or something like that on the surface of the ground. So um, it's, still, it's still correct that the, uh, if, if you go down a mine, yes, um, you'll be protected from um, the cosmic rays, but you'll still get a, something of a dose from the rocks around you. But you can't expect your own body potential. Um, so um, both are true, yes. We might have to leave it there now. Um, but we might have you back again to do another talk. Um, Don, not you. Yeah. <laughs> Does it contain potassium? <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Ian. This has been most enlightening, and I'm sure most of us have been very surprised by the, the, the wider scientific view that we're getting from what has been the public perception for all these years, probably boosted by um, mass hysteria and, and media publicity on radiation. It, it's uh, quite an eye opener. It certainly changes our uh, perspective on, on, on radiation. I'm wondering if we're going to hear the same thing about uh, global warming and carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably going down the same path. Thank you very much.